I'm writing this out of the absolutely desperate hope that maybe just one of you will be able to read this. I woke up just a little over a week ago and everything was normal. I lived by myself in an apartment on the outskirts of town and I don't really get out much aside from work and socializing with a few friends. I got up this particular morning and everything seemed fine. I checked my phone, didn't have any messages, which was slightly odd, but it was a Sunday so the lack of any email or texts wasn't entirely out of the question. I was getting into my car when I noticed, in that sort of off-handed way that one notices such things, that one of the neighbors across the street was mowing his lawn. I waved, but he didn't look up from his mowing. I just shrugged it off and went to work. When I got home, he was still mowing his lawn. I got out of my car and stood in the parking lot, watching him. I tried to think of any reason he might still be out. There was no way this dude had been out there for going on nine hours, just mowing that same patch of lawn. But all of the grass was cut, and it looked like he was just going in the same back and forth pattern. I checked to make sure my phone was in my pocket, and I walked over to see what was up. It was just too weird not to ask about. When I got closer, I could see that the top of his bald head was blustered from the sun. It was a hot day, and his shirt was soaked completely with sweat. His eyes were glazed over, and dry-looking. I didn't think he'd blinked in quite a while. Hey, I said over the sound of the mower. He didn't answer, just kept mowing. Hey, are you okay, dude? Nothing. I stood there for a while, before I called the cops. I figured he had some weird psychotic break, or maybe he was on drugs and didn't know how much time had passed. When they showed up, they tried to get him to stop, but he just kept mowing. Eventually, they called an ambulance, and it took three cops to get this guy to let go of his mower and to climb onto the gurney. Watching him move, it was like his muscles were locked, like they were trying to move a corpse going into rigor mortis, and the guy never made a sound, never blinked. I gave my statement, and when the cops left, I went back inside. It shook me, but I tried my best to brush it off and relax. I drank a few beers and went to bed. I woke up the next morning like normal, and I checked my phone. No messages. I got dressed, walked out to my car, and started the drive to work. And that's when shit hit the fan. Not even a block from my apartment. I started seeing devastation. Cars had crashed into buildings embankments, road signs. Debris covered the street, knocked out of garbage cans, and thrown from popped trunks. I slammed on my brakes and stared. It was like my mind couldn't process what I was seeing, or wouldn't process. All the people I could see, I mean all of them, were just frozen in place. They were still inside the ruined husks of their cars, just sitting there. On the sidewalks, people had stopped mid-stride, I saw one man who was frozen in a half crouch. He was going to tie his shoe. And I could hear the strangest sound, like a hodgepodge of voices, all mixed together, but not saying anything. I walked over to the man tying his shoe, and I pinpointed one piece of the sound coming from the woman walking closely behind him. She had a cell phone pressed to her ear. Her mouth was open, frozen, in the middle of a word. She was making a non-stop, drawn-out, ah sound. You know how sometimes a video game will lag, and the character dialogue will freeze on one sound? It was like that. I listened to this woman make that sound for five minutes. I timed it. She should have run out of breath. But she didn't. She just kept making that sound. I don't remember much about what I did for the next few hours. I know at some point I got back in my car and drove into town avoiding the cars that had crashed and the people who were frozen in the middle of the streets. I stopped in the middle of town and left my car running. I ran into every business on both sides of the street 
hoping to find even one other person who was moving. I didn't find a single one, and it seemed like it was just the people who were frozen. I could hear birds chirping, and I saw a few dogs running, their leashes trailing behind them. The wind still blew, the trees moved, but all of the people, they, they stopped. At the movie theater, the popcorn still turned in the kettle, blackened and smoking. I dumped it out and turned off the machine. I don't know why, I guess it felt good to do something, anything that felt normal. I went to a restaurant and ate a slice of pizza next to a girl in the middle of a bite of salad. I put my arm around her and talked to her. Come here often? I said. I groped her breast, pulled her shirt down. I was hoping she would wake up, slap me, do anything. But she just sat there, her fork full of salad barely touching her lips. I slapped her, hard. It was like slapping a mannequin. I left after that. I walked around town until it got dark, listening to the odd laggy sounds of half-finished words coming from the people I passed. In the less reputable part of town, I could hear a drawn-out scream. In another house, the unmistakable sound of an orgasm never finished. I ended up in the suburbs again. As I was passing one house, I heard a new sound. My gut knew what it was, and even though I wanted so badly not to confirm it, I couldn't help it. I had to see it for myself. The door was unlocked, so I went in. I followed the sound upstairs into a little bedroom. The walls were a sunny yellow. The curtains billowed inward, the breeze puffing them out. It was a happy room. Warm. Inviting. The crib was bright white. There were wooden letters on the wall above it. Justin, they said. The baby was on his back. His head turned slightly to the side. He was dressed in a pale yellow onesie, printed with cheerful ducks, wearing red rain boots. His face was bright red, screwed up in an expression of extreme distaste. His cry was needling, plaintive. I guessed that he'd woken up hungry from a nap, had just begun to cry when whatever this thing was happened. I touched his face. It was rigid. I wandered through the house. His mother was sitting on the edge of her bed, her head in her hands, and I crouched down, looking up at her from below. She looked tired. She must have been napping too. I went back to the baby. For some reason, I couldn't bring myself to leave. I sat on the floor, his cry constant and driving. At some point, I curled up and passed out. I've been in this house for going on a week now. The internet hasn't gone out yet, or the power. I figured it would have by now, but I guess things are running fine on their own for now. The water is still fine, too. My best guess is that this thing, this freezing, happened right after the cops came and took my neighbor away. Maybe it spread like a disease, and he was one of the first to be affected. Maybe it happened so fast that no one had time to report it. I don't know for sure. I'm beginning to think I'll never know. The first two days, I took my car and went into town. I wandered around the shops, took things I'd always wanted but never let myself have. I smashed windows, kicked over displays. I rode a shopping cart through the aisles of a store, knocking over a few people in the process. I brought trunkfuls of stuff back to the house, spread my loot out, and I looked at it all. It didn't make me as happy as it should have, and I broke a lot of it in a fit of anger. The third night, the silence started to get to me. I went outside and walked down the street, screaming and shouting every obscenity I could, hoping someone would answer me back. I climbed into cars, honked their horns, I punched people that I passed on the street, I hit them in their faces, their guts. I kicked men as hard as I could in the balls. I found a knife at one point, and I carved the penis into the face of a young man sitting on a stoop, smoking a cigarette. He bled, but he never moved. The same night, I broke into an apartment building in a nicer part of town. I found a young woman in one of the apartments, lying on her bed. She was in the middle of sending a text. The battery on the phone had died, so she stared blankly at a blank screen. I'm not proud of it, but I took the knife I found, and I attacked her. I wrapped my hands around her neck, swore at her, called her awful names, and I cried. Her body was warm, but stiff. Eventually, 
I curled up next to her. I held her, wept loudly into her hair. I begged her to talk to me. I apologized for attacking her. I ran my finger along her lips and I fell asleep with my arms, encircling her stone-like body, her hair damp with my snot and tears. I tried calling my parents a few times. Their phones went straight to voicemail. Same with my friends, my co-workers. I dialed 911 and the phone just rang and rang. I let it ring until my phone died a few hours later. I called my parents again and I left them messages, telling them I love them, that I was sorry for being a shitty kid and not calling enough. I suppose I could drive out to see them, but somehow, the possibility of them being unfrozen and just unreachable makes the situation better. I don't think I could stand to see them stuck like statues. My dad in his chair, reading forever. My mom in her garden, bent over her flowers in the dead of night, parts of her eaten by wild animals, taking advantage of a warm, unmoving meal. I try not to think about it too much. The last few days, I've just stayed inside. I play music on my laptop, which I went and got from my apartment. I eat mostly processed food out of cans and bags. I don't heat anything up. I don't have the energy to anymore. Every day, I post this story on various forums, waiting for someone, anyone, to write me back. I refresh the pages of all the big news sites, all the boards on 4chan, my newsfeed on Tumblr, and no one has posted anything. Whatever this thing is, it isn't just here. It's everywhere. Even on international sites, the pages are quiet. No one is posting. I would give anything to hear back from someone anyone. I don't want to be alone anymore. Because the people around me, these horrible living statues, they're still being affected by time. The mother's name is Vivian. I found her wallet and checked her license. Vivian's hair is starting to fall out. Her skin is shrinking around her bones, drying out. One of her nails came off yesterday. Justin's voice broke three days ago. All that comes out is a horrible cracked whisper, like wind through dead grass. His little body is so small and dried up. His hands, his poor hands, the skin looks like bark. I give him water, but it just pulls in the back of his throat. His diaper is still dry. I, um, I tried suffocating him. I put a pillow over his face. It didn't make him stop. I, I want him to stop. Please, God, I want him to stop. It's been a little over a week. Soon the voices outside, the few of them that remain, will go quiet, and I will be the only living human in a world of corpses. If anyone is out there, please, please write me back. I found a gun in the house next door. When Justin finally does stop making that awful whispering scream, and the house is quiet, I'm going to use it. First on him, then on Vivian, and then on myself. If you are reading this, and you can move, please, please write me. Help me. I took a walk in the woods. I love being out in the wild. The racket that nature makes when it's left alone. <sighs> I live near a very large, state-protected forest, and while it's not exactly legal to do. Sometimes I go along trails that aren't mapped. I've lived here my whole life. I know this area well. I'm used to going out and getting lost, though with GPS, it's hard to get really truly lost. It's relaxing to find myself in places I've never been. I don't find it eerie or intimidating. And with my new job, I haven't had as much time to go out as I would like. Adult life brings along things quote unquote more important then strapping on my pack and wandering out into nature with a can of bug spray and a book or two. But this weekend, I had some free time, so I went for a long walk. I live in the northwest, and if you've been in the woods here, you know how dense the undergrowth gets in the summer. But it's fall right now, and while it's certainly still jungly out there, it's not impassable like it can be at the height of the growing season. I went along the map trail for a few miles, then struck out on my own. It was beautiful. 
The trees were on fire with bright orange leaves, a carpet of them had already fallen, and they crunched under my feet in an entirely satisfying way. I listened to the birds calling, the rustle of small animals in the bushes. There is no more beautiful place on earth than a northwest forest in fall. I went for about four miles, going on in no particular direction, before I stopped to eat the small lunch that I'd packed. I sat on a rock and closed my eyes, the sun leaking through the canopy and warming pieces of my face. A squirrel screamed at me from somewhere above, and in time, it prompted me to move on. I went another three or so miles before I stopped and set up camp. Normally, I limit my trees to same-day excursions, but how could I pass up a weekend spent in the woods, especially when it was so lit up, so dripping with fall? The night was clear, bitterly cold. I huddled in my sleeping bag and listened to the forest come to life around me. At some point, I heard the soft scrape of a muzzle against the side of my tent. A deer, coming to inspect the odd spot of green in the clearing. I slept very well and woke refreshed, feeling more myself than I had in a long time. I walked through the woods at a casual pace, monitoring my progress with my GPS. By noon, I had gone another four miles, leaving me about ten from where I'd started. Far from home, from the noise and bustle and anti-like stupidity of modern life. So, it was a surprise when I stepped on something and heard the unmistakable snap of plastic shattering. I looked down, coming out of my pseudo-trance, and lifting my boot, I saw a flash of bright blue pressed into the dirt. I bent down and picked it up, the cap to a ballpoint pen, now broken into several pieces. I stood up and glanced around. Litter isn't uncommon... We are a generally filthy species, but I had rarely found it so far out before. I saw no signs of recent human activity, but the pen cap was new, hardly faded. I put it in my pocket with a small spark of irritation. It seems we can't go anywhere without leaving traces of ourselves behind. I kept walking. I had only gone another quarter of a mile when I saw the pen stuck into the ground, point up. I growled, honestly angry now and poured it out of the ground. I shoved it into my pocket, entertaining evil thoughts directed at whoever had been out here, and felt it necessary to leave parts of their life behind. Something glints, sparking a beam of sunlight halfway up a tree ahead of me. I squinted, tried to make it out. It wasn't just one spark of light, I realized. Something reflective had been placed up the tree. What on earth? I went closer, my neck craned up to get a better look. It took me a moment to understand what I was seeing. Pens. At least 40 or 50. They had been pushed into the bark of the tree point first. All different kinds, from what I could tell. Cheap ballpoints, fine tip, gel, even one Monte Blanc. They bristled out of the tree like porcupine quills. I stood for a long time. My mouth screwed tight, brow furrowed. An art project, I decided. Some sort of odd, modern statement of the banality of modern life against the harshness and beauty of nature. I lived in a hippie-centric area of the country, and this was just the sort of thing I could see someone doing, coming out here to this remote part of the woods and filling a tree with pens. How many other people would even see this? Maybe that was the point. It would certainly make an excellent story. I touched a pen in my pocket, and I moved on. I walked through the woods, allowing my mind to clear again. Something had changed. The once calm, tranquil atmosphere of my walk had been shattered with the knowledge that someone else had been here. Could, I suppose, still be out here. And I began feeling something that I'd never felt out in the woods before. A tightness in my chest. The temptation to glance behind me. Sweat pooled under my armpits. Ran down my sides. I was nervous. For the first time in my life... I was scared of the emptiness and simultaneous fullness of the forest around me. I hummed to myself, told myself I was being childish, but the image kept coming back to me. A hippie, their hair and long dreadlocks, lugging a bag full of pens into the middle of the woods, following the exact non-trail I'd taken up here, so far from anything. How had they gotten that far up the tree? I imagined them scrambling up with a home-cooked device using a hammer to pound the pens into the bark, the sound echoing around, slamming into the trees, 
and ricocheting off like bullets. That, more than anything, disturbed me. The sound of a hammer in the wilderness. I was so deep in thought that I didn't notice I'd come to the clearing until I'd almost stepped on the shirt. I stopped just in time, my foot only an inch or two above it. I pinwheeled my arms, stumbling backward to the edge of the clearing. My eyes focused. I took in the scene in front of me. Blood rushed to my head, my hands and feet going cold. My hand went to my pocket, gripped the pen. As I scanned from left to right, the clearing was square, almost perfectly so. The bushes, undergrowth, everything had been stripped away. All that remained was the rich, dark soil, and in the middle of the clearing was a stunted, scrawny tree of middling size. The branches were knobbly, oddly twisted. Beginning at the edge of the clearing, where I now stood, a spiral pattern had been created, winding around many times until it ended at the foot of the strange tree. Clothes, laid out as if waiting to be put on. All different, but all belonging, it seemed, to men. The outfit nearest me closely resembled my own. A plaid shirt, workman's jeans, leather boots, neatly laid out, free of any debris or fallen leaves. I followed the spiral, taking note of certain outfits. A very nice, expensive suit, complete with tie and leather dress shoes. A polyester fast food uniform, a blazer and slacks. A cotton t-shirt with sweatpants, the sneakers well worn. My gaze returned to the outfit at my feet, and at the collar of the shirt, it appeared something had been planted. A row of something, dull white. I bent down, the popping of my knees causing my heart to leap. I reached out, brushed one of the white things, before recoiling with a strangled yelp. Teeth pressed into the dirt. The molar still had bits of food in the creases. The teeth were in order, evenly spaced in a horrible grin. The roots had been pressed into the soil, ensuring that they would not easily be disturbed. I stood, gingerly stepped into the clearing, and walked along the spiral. Every outfit was complete, with teeth, all evenly spaced, all accurate down to the last canine. As I got closer to the tree, shivering with a primal fear and dreadful fascination that I'd never known, I began to hear a humming. It vibrated through the air and into the small bones of my ears. I could feel it deep in my head, in the darkest part of my brain. It was coming from the tree. I stood in front of it, carefully avoiding the cotton long sleeve shirt at the base. The top of the tree was only a few feet above my head, and I was able to clearly observe the strange, shriveled seed pods on the tips of the branches. I had never seen anything like them. Upon closer inspection, it seemed that they were almost impaled upon the points of the skinny shriveled branches. One near my eye level was thicker than the others. More ripe. I reached out to touch it. The surface of it erupted, exploding out toward me in a fury of humming and buzzing. I cried out, flinching backward, and felt the brush of wings against my hands. I looked at the seed pod, now clear of flies, and saw that it was not a seed pod at all. It was a tongue, one end ragged as if ripped off by force. The flies began to return, crawling all over the surface, lapping at the liquefying tissue. They clambered over one another in a frenzy, their awful wings humming and burrowing to my ears. My head. It felt as if my head was just coming apart. The buzzing got louder, and I felt a stinging sensation on my stomach. I stumbled back, my vision tunneling, and all I could hear was the resonating thrum of the flies. I slipped on a shirt and could feel the teeth under my boot, and I ran. I ran out of the clearing, crashed through the woods, but still... I could hear the flies. No matter how fast I ran, I couldn't hear anything but the buzzing of the flies. I screamed and my head ripped apart inside. As I fell, I could feel thousands, thousands of tiny legs crawling onto my face, into my ears. I blacked out, shrieking into the all-consuming rumble and thrumming of the flies. I woke up. How much later, I couldn't tell. I was on the trail inside of the entrance to the woods. I could not remember getting here. I could not remember my desperate flight through the woods that would have taken me back to where I'd started. I picked myself up, the scratches covering my face and arms burning. 
I limped back to my car, drove home in a daze. I entered my apartment, heard from some distance the meowing of my two cats, angry about my late arrival and offended by their bowls that had only been empty for a few hours. I fed them to pacify them. I stripped my clothes off, dropped into a warm bath, and I fell asleep. I woke up a few hours ago. I have cleaned my scratches, thrown away my filthy, torn clothes, and I have now only noticed that the rash on my stomach is something more than that. In the mirror, it's reversed, but if I were able to step outside myself, I would be able to read what it says. Quiet. I loved my wife. I loved her so much. She was unspeakably precious to me, and we were so happy. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about how we met or our life before that house. It's both unimportant and painful. But I, I want to stress that I loved her more than anything in the world. I would watch her sleep, her eyelashes resting on her cheeks. Her lips parted while she snored softly. I adored her from the moment we met, and that over-the-moon feeling never stopped. She was beautiful. She had red hair that she wore in a braid over her shoulder. One hand was slightly bigger than the other, and we joked about it. She was small, but not bird-like. When she laughed, I laughed too. She had a habit of bumping into me when we walked together in public, as if she was just making sure that I was there. I had never met someone who I shared that much joy with who was so easy to be around. I married her the second I got the chance. I loved her so much. She got pregnant four months ago. We agreed our apartment wasn't going to cut it, so we looked around for a nice starter house in the country. Nothing huge, nothing fancy, just a one-story box we could raise our child in. We ended up getting a great deal on a small house about 20 minutes outside of town. Since I worked from home, the commute wasn't going to be an issue, and we both agreed that we would prefer to raise a baby well away from the inner city. My wife was raised on a large piece of property in northern Maine, and she was always talking about how nice it was, how you could go to sleep with your window open at night and hear only the sounds of the animals, the wind moving through the trees. The snow makes a sound when it falls, did you know that? She asked me once. It sounds like sighing. I had been raised in a high rise in the middle of a huge metropolitan area, I did not know that the snow made a sound as it fell. I was charmed. We moved in around November when she was about two months along, and the first night we were there, it snowed. I opened our bedroom window wide and listened. See? She said, holding my arm. It sounds like so many little things sighing. We went back to bed, and I held her close as I made love to her, very gently. We set up the house and decorated it with a nonspecific but pleasing theme. We met our few neighbors, whose houses were spaced a good distance from ours and each other. Everyone was pleasant and seemed happy to have a young couple finally join the community. A few of us agreed to exchange keys in case of an emergency or an accidental lockout. It tickled me. I wasn't used to such open hospitality. My wife fit in wonderfully. A pretty young mother-to-be, our neighbors fawned over her. They showered us in cookies, dinners and casserole dishes, hand-knitted gifts for the baby. My wife handled these gifts with her usual grace and smiled sweetly when she received them. She would hold the handmade misshapen clothes and beam at the older women who delivered them. She would make a great fuss, invite the women in for tea, and sit company with them, all while exclaiming over the cuteness of the lumpy booties, the bulbous hats, and when the women left, she would show them to me and we would laugh. Wondering about what sort of monstrous child could possibly even fit them, we were happy. My wife grew more and more radiant every day. Her small little belly grew to a noticeable bump, and I'd walk in on her standing in the nursery, touching the walls, the crib, whispering to the baby growing inside of her. I held her at night, my hands protectively cupping her belly. I kissed her neck and was so overwhelmed by how much I loved her. I told her I would protect her, keep her and our child safe. She curled her toes around mine and sighed deeply as she drifted to sleep. God, I loved her so much. The sleepwalking started around her third month. The first night it happened, I woke up in the middle of the night and sat up. It seemed like something had startled me out of my sleep. A sound, or maybe a flicker of light. 
I turned to look at my wife and found that she was not there. I wasn't alarmed at first. More and more, she got up to urinate multiple times at night. As the baby grew, it pressed against her bladder. She complained about it in her good nature way, shuffling off to the bathroom. I got up and knocked on the bathroom door, and it opened. She wasn't inside. Slightly more awake, I padded out of the bedroom and wandered the house, looking in the various rooms. Honey? A whisper called. What's going on? Are you okay? Where are you? She didn't answer. My heart started to beat a bit faster. I opened the hall closet and jumped back, startled as a broom fell out. I caught it and stuffed it back in. Thoroughly spooked, I wandered the house, looking in the dining room, the living room, the spare bedroom and bathroom. My heart beat faster. My nerves rose with every empty space. And when I flicked on the kitchen light, I yelped before I could stop myself. She was standing on the kitchen counter, her head cocked to one side, as if she was listening. My heart dropped, and I ran over to her. Ellie, I said, holding her ankle. E Ellie? Honey, calm down. W what are you doing? Are you all right? She didn't respond to my voice or my touch. It took me a moment to realize she was still asleep. Terrified, I ran into the dining room and I grabbed the chair. I brought it over to her and, with great difficulty, I coaxed her to step down onto it. I scooped her up into my arms and, holding her tightly, I carried her back to our bedroom. Her eyes were wide open, unseeing. She mumbled something as I put her down and I shushed her as I tucked her in. She mumbled again, looked me in the eye, and went back to sleep. She was snoring before I was back in bed. Not bothering to go shut off the kitchen light, I crawled up beside her holding her tightly against me. I stayed awake for an hour or so, waiting to see if she would try to get up again. When I was reasonably sure that she wouldn't, I fell back into a restless sleep. The next morning when we woke up sweaty and tangled together, I asked her if she remembered anything. Her blue eyes, wide, she searched my face for truth and when she saw it, she covered her mouth with childish alarm. You have to start locking the bedroom at night, John. She was adamant. She wouldn't risk harm to our unborn child. I installed a lock that afternoon, but the sleepwalking continued. Almost every night, I would wake up to an empty bed, and I'd find my wife in various places around our room, in the closet, curled by the door, standing by the window. One particularly terrifying episode, I found her on top of our huge burrow. She was hunched against the wall, her eyes wide and feral. I had no idea how she'd even gotten up there, and I had to go get a ladder to get her down. As I helped her navigate the steps, she said something. Her small feet touched a carpet and she looked me in the eye with grave seriousness. You can't save us, John, she whispered. But don't worry, we will be waiting for you. It was eerie how her eyes looked when she said it, lit as if by some queer radioactive light. I shushed her and tucked her back into bed. One night, I found her out the window it was open, the curtains blowing around her like wings. I got up to help her, and as I got nearer, I saw that she was pressed against the windowsill. Her belly was crushed against it, and her eyes stared at the sleeping landscape. Her hands hung limp at her sides. I grabbed her, harder than I intended, and it woke her up. Alarmed, she gripped my hands, which dug into my shoulders. Her eyes were hurt, terrified. John? She choked out. Her knees gave out, and I managed to catch her. She clutched her belly, moaning. I told her to hold still, to hang on, to take a deep breath. She reached between her legs, and when she drew them back, there were spots of blood on her fingertips. She let out a breathy scream. The ambulance came and took my poor, terrified wife away, and I rode with her, holding her hand. Her smaller hand. Her eyes never left mine. The ultrasound revealed that Nothing was wrong. The baby hadn't been hurt. Spotted, the doctor said, was not unheard of at this age, but the doctor warned us we were to keep him informed of any further incidences. We were beyond relieved. I kissed my wife as she wept, relieved, and I dried her tears. The doctor prescribed a very mild sedative to help her sleep at night. She began taking the sedatives, and as quickly as it started, the sleepwalking stopped. She slept soundly. Her hands curled under her chin. I watched her sleep, my heart full to bursting. 
I loved her so much. Shortly after my wife began to sleep at night, my nightmares began. They were always the same. I would wake up, and Ellie would be gone. I would get up, frantic, and search the house for her. The rooms were empty, full of a strange thick fog that burned as I inhaled it. It was caustic, smelling strongly of ozone. The fog made the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end as I ran through it, as if it were electric. It slowed me down, made it hard to search for her. Eventually, I would end up at the back door, and I would throw it open to find that the backyard had been replaced by a featureless gray landscape. It was like stepping into thick mud, the way it grabbed onto my bare feet, wormed between my toes. I would wander around the perimeter of the house, calling her name. The sky went on and on, cloudless and dark, and when I looked up at it, I could feel with a dizzying certainty that if I were to fall up into it, I would fall forever. The only thing keeping me on the ground was the sticky, mud-like stuff. I would call her name over and over, the sound falling flat on the still air. I would end up back where I started, and my heart would start the race. Where was Ellie? Where was my sweet, pretty wife? I had to protect her from whatever was coming. And something was coming. I could hear it. The sound reverberated from the sky, rolling across the dead, flat land. A low, electric humming. The mud would cling to my feet, holding me in place. And I would sense her behind me, as if she had been there all along. John? She would whisper. I would try to turn, but could only move my eyes. I would strain them, trying to look over my shoulder, just to see her face. She would lay her hand, her larger hand, on my shoulder. I love you. John, I love you. I knew it wasn't my wife. I would scream, and I could hear the roar as the sky began to fall, racing toward the earth, falling through infinity to crush me, crush her, crush everything that we'd ever hoped and felt and dreamed, and the hand on my shoulder would grip me tighter, and... I would fly upright. The sheet stuck to my damp skin. A scream caught in my throat. I would immediately turn to her, my lovely sleeping wife, and I would touch her shoulder gently. She would frown. Her lips pursed into a child's petulant bow and roll over, farther from my touch. I would lay back down, watch the rise and fall of her back, breathing deeply. I loved her so much. When we were reasonably sure that her sleepwalking would not continue, my wife stopped taking her sedatives. They made it hard, she said, to get up and use the bathroom when she needed to. For the first few nights she was off of them, I stayed awake, watching her. My nightmares made sleep undesirable as it was, so I didn't mind. Aside from her frequent trips to relieve herself, she slept soundly. I began to love these late nights, staying awake and watching her sleep. She mumbled sometimes, but nothing I could understand. I would stroke her red hair, touch her skin. Sometimes she would smile. Sometimes she would turn away. Most nights, I would be awake watching her until after midnight. It was peaceful, listening to her breathing, watching the moon slip behind the clouds. The owls hooted, small animals moved through the brush, and I could appreciate why people chose to be nocturnal like them. But as the sleep deprivation caught up with me, I began to drift off earlier and earlier. Her leaving always woke me up, but slowly... Our routine began to go back to the way it had been, before the sleepwalking, before the nightmares. We slept soundly, our rhythms in sync once again, and I loved her. I loved her more every day. Two weeks ago, I woke up after midnight. It was snowing. My wife wasn't beside me. I sat up and the air felt thick around me, palpable. I felt an odd sense of calm, and almost medicated feeling. I had been deeply asleep, I supposed, but despite the drag of sleep wanting to bring me back to the covers, the warm pillows, I waited for her to return. And I waited. I watched the minutes pass on our small digital clock, and I got out of bed and went to the window. I opened it. The sky was gray, lit with a dull light from the town, so far from us. Snow was falling. I could hear it settling on the branches of the trees, the half-buried grass. She's right, I thought. It sounds like the sighing of many small things. I watched it for a while, listened to the sighing snow, the land around us, our neighbors, tucked in and quiet, all of us in hibernation, 
waiting for the sunlight to tell us to come out, to see the new day. The air was cold on my face. After some time, how much I don't know, I closed the window and turned back to the room. It had been quite some time. I felt the pull of my wife somewhere in our house. I opened the door and paddled into the hallway. It seemed to me that I could still hear the sighing of the snow, even through our walls. It was so quiet. The light at the end of the hall was on, our spare bathroom. I stood in front of the door. I listened and heard nothing but a small sighing of the many things outside. I knocked gently, and the door swung open. And for a wonderful moment, the last one, everything was still wonderful. My sleeping wife, my lovely, childlike, beautiful wife must have woken up sick and had come in here to avoid waking me. I wanted to comfort her. I held my hand out to touch her back, which was facing me. She was curled by the toilet, her head in her hands. It was so sweet of her to think of me even as the illness, which came so rarely now, gripped her. Her head in her hands, her red hair flowing over her shoulders and hiding her face. She was so small, so lovely and innocent. Her head bobbed and my heart ached for her. I loved her so much. Her hands, which were cupped at her mouth, holding in the sickness. I loved her so much. I looked at her, down at my hand, which reached out to her, saw the blood that I was standing in, that I had tracked onto the bottom hems of my pant legs. I said her name, her name that I whispered in her ear as I made love to her, her name that I turned into Ellie Belly when I was teasing her. I said her name and she looked up at me, her blue eyes so wide with wonder and that queer light. Her face was smeared, covered with something more red than lipstick. It was on her hands, trailed from her, past my feet, out the door. Her hands that I loved to kiss and hold had something cupped in them. She smiled up at me, her wonderful child smile, and the red was on her teeth. She smiled and the red dripped down her pretty face. John, she whispered. I love you, John. Her head dipped, brought her red mouth with the red teeth inside to her red hands. She bit and swallowed, smiled up at me, dipped her head, bit, swallowed. I watched her delicate throat move with each mouthful she took. I fell to my knees, into the red that tracked up her shins, up her thighs, that was slowly trickling out of her darkening her pants. She smiled at me again. The red, the dark, dark red was caught in between her teeth. John, she whispered. I had to get it back inside. I, I had to, don't you see? She held her hands out to me, one hand bigger than the other, just slightly. I looked at what remained and all I saw was red, dark, dark red. She smiled, my innocent wife who I loved so much. I had to get it back inside.